Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our good friend, Sam Clement. Sam, say hello. Hey, John. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. I hope you're doing well. I am doing well. It's been a good week so far. No, it has been. You know, what was really kind of interesting about last week was last week, last Wednesday, we had two very major newsworthy events, right? Ones that we had talked about with our advisors and really amongst ourselves for what a couple of weeks leading up to it, it was uh yeah without a doubt to, yeah, to put it lightly it was a oh. i mean I, I hate to put it in any particular order but uh doing what we do for a living we had spoken with our advisors at our firm at our firm here oakworth about the fomc meeting the federal open market committee uh which is the policy making arm of the federal reserve they were having their uh, they were going to announce their decision on monetary policy last Wednesday around one o'clock central time. That's generally when they come out with their statement and then their comments by Jay Powell afterwards. And then also last Wednesday, uh, we had the much anticipated and ballyhooed, I think, uh, summit, if you will call it that, not really a summit, not long enough, anywhere near long enough to call it a summit, but meeting or discussion between President Biden and uh, President Putin. And you and I have talked about this. I hesitate to call Vladimir Putin president because I really seriously, I mean this. I'm not just trying to be funny. I think he needs to quit screwing around, acknowledge the obvious and crown himself czar. That's the way he wants to behave. <laughs> and you know, that's the way he behaves. And if all of a sudden he just goes, listen, I'm the autocrat of all the Russias, then everyone will go, okay, well, fine. You're finally, you're finally acting like it. You know, as opposed <laughs> to sitting there saying we're a democracy just go ahead and call yourself an autocrat, the emperor of all the Russias, the czar. And so I like it. We, I, I like it too. Now, the thing is, despite how widely anticipated, widely and wildly anticipated these two meetings were, Sam, I think it's at least general consensus around here at Oakworth Capital Bank, that neither one of them was going to produce anything extraordinary. And well, what do you think happened? They really didn't. I mean, you know, obviously, the as far as the stock market, the Federal Reserve was intuitively going to move the market more than the so-called summit would. Um, but even then, it seemed like, you know, the market ticked down a little bit and uh, people kind of took it in stride. And, you know, there wasn't much takeaway different from what the Fed has tried their best to drill into our heads for the last several months. And so with that being said, the market really took it with a uh, took it in stride, kind of with a grain of salt, uh, especially with Powell's comments that, you know, everyone looks at the dot plot. That's the hot trigger word now, but he said we haven't even talked about rate hikes, so this is useless right now. I mean, it, it is absolutely useless. And so, with that being said, the market, for all intents and purposes, took it in stride. And your thoughts on the uh, so-called summit between the two leaders? You know, every time we talk about the U.S.-Russia relations, diplomatic relations, I think back to Mitt Romney um, saying that Russia was our biggest geopolitical threat and uh, Obama saying the 1980s call, they want their foreign policy back. And, you know, here we are with Russians hacking our pipelines, our, our critical infrastructure. And um, I, I did not think there was much to take away from that, especially when uh, Biden didn't take pre-prepared questions like he um, so gracefully mentioned. Well, I got to tell you, and now my thoughts on really kind of both of those, and then we'll kind of get down the weeds a little bit after our generic thoughts. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the FOMC meeting. You know, Sam, we talk about the overnight lending target every morning on our morning call with client advisors. And, you know, I go through, I take a look at the CME expectations and where the money is and the futures market in terms of uh, the overnight rate and all that good or bad stuff, depending on how you view the world. And there just wasn't any chance that the Fed was going to do anything this meeting. As a matter of fact, the, the money says the Federal Reserve is not going to make any substantive change, substantive, gosh, I can't talk, changes to the overnight lending target for at least 12 months for at least 12 months. The last couple of uh, meetings, taking a look at the dot, dot plots, they're not gonna do anything for at least another 12 months, at least. And the dot plots from the last meeting suggested that what, in 2023, we might get a, a, a rate hike or two? Yeah, I mean, uh, two, two years out from now, it's a useless predictor to predict something like that two years <laughs> so, from now. It is absolutely a waste of time to put 
Well, anyway. I mean, in a lot of ways. And so I, I think I kind of put the cart before the horse or what have you. I mean, prior to the meeting last Wednesday, the dot plots were saying nothing, at least through the end of 2023, right? And then all of a sudden, last Wednesday, the dot plots say maybe a couple increases their net lending target in 2023, largely probably towards the back half of 2023. So, we're, Sam, we're looking at no changes to the overnight rate for two years. Yep. And the markets, oh, you know, all, I mean, just my goodness, the people are there on the TV sitting around, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And then they were, how are they going to taper their bond purchases? All this stuff. 24 months out. I mean, Sam, come on. You're going to predict 20, 24 months ago, we didn't even know what COVID-19 was. And what, 24 months ago, Donald Trump finally announced his, uh, he was going to run for his second term of office. Yeah. So a lot has changed in 24 months. So to sit there and try to you know get all worked up and wring your hands and gnash your teeth about whether or not the Fed's going to raise their overnight lending target by the end of 2023 is kind of foolish in my estimation. Now, obviously, there are a lot of people that made a lot of bets with a lot of money on the on the um, future interest rates. I get that. But for the average person on the street, the average investor, and the vast majority of investors, and, and by all accounts, you know, the Fed, the, the Fed is, that's on hold. And even a couple of rate hikes in 2023, Sam, where does that... Where does that get the overnight lending target relative to inflation? If all, if at December thirty first, two thousand twenty three, the overnight lending target is seventy five basis points. I mean that <laughs> it's not. It doesn't even compare to what our our recent print of twelve month inflation. Obviously, I, I think we've talked about that being transitory, but it's hard to imagine that the the settled down inflation rate being less than seventy five basis points. You know, you take a look at the five-year tips market, take a look at the 10-year tips market and the 30-year tips market, we're seeing inflation expectations a little bit higher on the shorter end, but we're looking 2.3, 2.4, 2.5%, depending on what day of the week. I mean, you know, it's been kind of bouncing around a little bit, but we're looking at mid twos. That's kind of where the street thinks inflation is going to be. So so we take the overnight lending target. I mean, we, we usually, let's say we take it to 1%. That means overnight money is still well less than inflation. Yep. And it means for all intents and purposes, overnight money is free. Yeah. And by historical definition, that negative real interest rate, negative negative real interest rates, the difference between the overnight rate and the and, and inflation, when that goes into negative territory, that is considered incredibly accommodative, historically speaking. And so we had investors this week worried about that, and they got a little little bit out of shape on, on Wednesday, but not too much, like you said. Not too much. But, you know, even so, that was a little bit of a surprise. But, you know, Jay Powell kind of came in and calmed everyone down, and everyone realized, okay, that's, that's two years away. But then I'm going to shift mightily and talk about the meeting between Biden and Putin, I would say I wasn't expecting anything out of this, but I wanted it. Yeah. I mean, God. I think everyone wanted it. Everyone I think, wanted it. I think everyone wanted it. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when you go to see a professional wrestling match, you don't want to see them go and do some, you know, half Nelsons. I mean, you want to see something good, you know? Yeah, you don't want to see, you know, two boxers hug it out the whole round. You want to see yeah. some haymakers and some. Some good stuff. <laughs> it's a, there didn't seem to be any acrimony. Didn't seem to be any harsh words. It seemed to kind of be very well scripted, very well orchestrated. And you know, people people afterwards trying to analyze body positioning and body, you know, just oh my gosh, did did Putin look away uh, too quickly after the handshake? You know, what what was Biden nodding his head about? All this stuff. It's just like are you gonna tell me body language? Come on, really? I will I will say one thing about body language, and I'm not an expert in, in the field, but to me, Putin looked like, you know, a, a cool kid in the back of a high school classroom who had zero interest in the class that he was at. And that was very, it was very clear to me, at least to me, that he seemed very uninterested um, and unimpressed. And I will leave it at that. The only body language that I know without a doubt signifies someone's true intentions 
is when they run away from you. <laughs> and I had that happen a lot when I was in college. I, uh, you know, tried to buy a girl a drink at a party, not buy it, but get them one. Out the door they go. That suggests <laughs> to me, Sam, that they had no interest in talking to men. It's a fair assumption. I would assume. So that's the only body language I'm 100% uh, positive on. But you're absolutely right. You take a look at Lavrov, who's their foreign minister, and also Putin sitting in, in the chairs. They're just kind of slouching, you know? Kind of. He was. He was slouching. You no, know, slouching. He's kind of like, when's this over with? You know, yeah. let's get this over with. And I even was talking to a client earlier in the week, uh, last week, saying, well, how do you think this summit's going to go? How do you think they're going to go? And they're going to go, it's going to go something like this. Biden's going to go, knock it off with the cyber attacks. And Putin's going to go, no, nah, one not. One may. What, what cyber you, attack? <laughs> one may. And Blinken's going to go, you know, doggone well, it was at you. And uh, Lavrov is going to go, no. Nah. Mm -mm. Yeah, someone else, not us. And then Putin's going to say, not to us, next issue. And I mean, convince me I'm wrong. Well, what? <laughs> What are you going to do to him if he says no? It's kind of like how we joke about the Federal Reserve. If he says, I didn't do it. Okay. He didn't. <laughs> yeah. I kind of get it. Go to the next issue. He's not going to. He's not going to apologize. He is. You are Next issue. We'll talk 80 year old. About, we're going to talk about Ukraine going into NATO. Not going to happen. <laughs> next issue. You know. <laughs> So no one is really expecting too much out of that. And I don't know, maybe some people with the DNC, and I'm not trying to be too political here today, would just say, you know, um, Biden did what he wanted to do. And people in the, from the Kremlin would say Putin did what he wanted to do. Um, you know, you don't need to have two of the three uh, world's strongest military powers not even talk with one another. So if anything is positive about that, at least talking again, exchanging ambassadors, all that good stuff. Even so, getting long winded on all this, but the thing is, Sam, as you acknowledge and as I acknowledge or thought, neither of these two newsworthy, very heavily headlines, all that stuff, these two newsworthy events didn't produce any, in my estimation, truly newsworthy outcomes. Convince me I'm wrong. No, you're absolutely right. No, the stock prices, the stock market backs it up. These were essentially non-events to the financial world. Mostly. And, you, and as you and I talked on Friday of last week, yeah, in terms of the summit in Geneva, it's already off the front pages. Yeah, the the, the last story about it was uh, old man Biden going off at the CNN reporter for a unscripted question. And then, you know, that was there for a couple hours. And then next story. Yeah, he needs to knock that off. I mean, he, he's, he has a history of... Um, of doing that type of thing, getting angry reporters or people asking unscripted stuff. Yeah, he can't, that seems very, that doesn't seem like something you should be doing. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> and of course, people go, well, Trump had four years of doing stuff that he shouldn't be doing. I, I'm not saying that. You know, I'm not getting involved in that, just in any of them. Um, so, Sam, if these two newsworthy events were not the, didn't, didn't really pan out, or at least these two potentially newsworthy events last week weren't actually newsworthy, Pray tell, what was maybe arguably the most newsworthy event of last week? Well, well last Friday, well, well, first off, there, there's certain people, very few people who can move the market. It has to be someone with influence over it and uh, with an opinion that is changing the preconceived market's opinion already priced in. So, so like maybe Jay Powell? Yeah, maybe Jay Powell or maybe uh, another member of the Federal Reserve who's going to be voting next year. Well, so I mean, who? Oh, Jim, who Jimmy is, Bullard. Jim Bullard. Sam, I, who is that? Nobody even knows his name for the most part. I mean, if you know his name, you either work in banking, finance, IB, or, or something of the sorts, or you're just weirdly in tune with the Federal Reserve because there's not a whole lot of reason anyone should know his name that's not involved with this sector. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, my friends at Parkside Financial Bank out in St. Louis are going, come on, everyone knows who Jim Bullard is. And we're going to cut the suspense, which I know is as, as thick as pea soup right now, and tell you that Jim Bullard is the president of the St. Louis Fed, Federal Reserve Bank, right? Yep. 
And Mr. Bullock? A non-voting member. A non-voting member well, this he, year. Well, he's a non-voting member of on the Federal Open Market Committee, which is, again, the committee at the Fed that sets monetary policy. So what he has to say about interest rates this year, at least for the next six months, really doesn't matter too much. Yep. However, this morning on CNBC, Sam, I was driving, well, this morning, last Friday morning on CNBC, I was driving back from Mobile, Alabama to Birmingham, and I missed the comments. Please tell us, what did he say that was so so shocking? Well, th that goes back to my first caveat that it has to be someone obviously important enough whose opinion is valued enough, Check checks that box. But then he has to be going uh, against the grain for what the market has tended to price in. And like we talked about, about last Wednesday when the um, Jay Powell spoke and the dot plot came out and all that, yeah, the market maybe got a tiny bit upset, but it priced that in after that. So the market felt comfortable until somebody who's going to be voting next year comes out and says, that's wrong. Uh, or, you know, I'm going to be voting that it should be happening in 2022 for all intents and purposes. And so that's that perfect storm of somebody with the power to move the market saying something that is not priced into the market. And, and that is exactly uh, what the case was. He, he was expecting rate hikes next year, uh, which is somewhat drastic. I mean, it still doesn't bother me, uh, give me a ton of heartburn, but that is a significant difference than what every other, essentially every other member of the uh, FOMC had uh, had talked about. And if you've listened this far, what really kind of made this unexpected was, was not only that it was Jim Bullard, um, but the also the timing, rate heights as early as 2022, whereas prior to this week, virtually everyone who works in this industry thought the first rate hikes would happen after 2023. So we're, th we're thinking at least 12 months earlier, if not 13 months earlier, at the minimum, the Fed starts hiking the overnight lending target and thereby taking credit out of the, out of the markets. But Sam, I think what was perhaps a little bit most surprising to me was, look, I know who Bullard is. Uh, you know, I understand he's not on the FOMC, but the, the, the president of the St. Louis Fed is, you know, in the, in the hierarchy, he's in there. I mean, he's in there. And, and for him to come out and say something that was eh, kind of significantly different in my estimation of what Jay Powell said just on Wednesday afternoon, for all intents and purposes, was a little unusual for a Fed president to be kind of not towing the party line, one, but certainly not towing the party line as well as he should be so, so soon after his boss, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, was over the tape saying something maybe a little bit different. Your thoughts? And that that that's the gist of it. it. It was so different from what the market had expected, and, and that is that's the gist of it all. I think last Friday the S and P ended up down. I think close to one point four percent. I mean, it was pretty much constant selling throughout the day. It's 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 not the good kind of selling that flushes out you know shorts and mm -hmm. and resets things. It was just kind of that brutal constant grinding downwards of of pretty much all the indices, and and the markets are all built around derivatives are built around everything is built around expectations i mean the currency markets it's all built around expectations and it changes on a dime when expectations change and then when somebody throws a wrench in all of those expectations things go haywire and that is shown time and time again i mean it was shown in you know back in uh 2018 i think it was when j pal you know could couldn't say the right words any of the meetings and he just continuously said the wrong Gosh, things that for what that meeting was awful it was. And he, he, he he's learned. He's doing much better. He is. He is doing much better. Maybe Bullard will learn after this one. Um, but when you change expectations, anybody who has the power to change the entire market's expectations, at least somewhat, it's going to cause pretty drastic moves and, and, and corrections, not necessarily a stock market correction, meaning 10% down, but just a correction to what's priced in as far as expectations. All right, Sam, I'm going to throw a hypothetical at you, starting to kind of wrap things up a little bit here. All right. Imagine you're at a cooking, out, you're cooking out somewhere. Okay. Imagine you're grilling out. And that's what we call barbecuing in the, in the deep south. When you're cooking hot dogs, hamburgers, steaks, that's grilling out. It's not barbecuing, right? It's not barbecuing. No, oh. bar barbecuing is something else altogether. So when you're grilling out maybe this weekend or what have you, 
and someone goes, who can move the markets? If, if Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin can't move the markets, two of the three most powerful people in the world, who in the world can move the markets? Your answer is? Jimmy Bullard. <laughs> <laughs> you say Jimmy, Jimmy Bullard. <laughs> Jimmy and everyone Bullard. would look at me like I have three eyes. <laughs> and they're going to say Jim J. Bullock? There you go. No. <laughs> no. The guy out in St. Louis, never heard of. <laughs> this guy is a banker. He's a bureaucrat. <laughs> never heard of him before. He's uh, he's got the, he's he's going, he's going to drain a couple trillion dollars out of, out of, the, out of, out of the market today. <laughs> Completely pull the plug out from. You know. <laughs> It's really kind of absurd, isn't it? I mean, if you think if you think about it, Vladimir Putin goes has a press conference and boldface lies to the world about what they're doing. Joe Biden. Yeah. Joe, Joe Biden, Biden gives a guy he called a killer a couple weeks before a pair of aviator sunglasses as a gift, which is, I mean, I think we need a whole episode on that topic in the first place. <laughs> but <then> none of <laughs> So, 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 so Putin goes and lies to the world, gets a pair of sunglasses. Joe, Joe Biden goes off the rails and yells at a young woman from Santa, and the market doesn't do squat. Doesn't even pay attention to it. Then this, then this banker, this banker who doesn't have any say so on monetary policy <laughs> this year gets on CNBC and says that yeah he might be up for might be up for a rate increase in 2022 you never know everyone gets wiped out <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of comical <laughs> that's kind of comical it's kind of comical because it's ridiculous. Uh, so, <laughs> I love that. I might get a t-shirt made up of that. You know the way I like to get t-shirts made up. <laughs> Who can move the markets? Jimmy and on the back, it's Jimmy Bullard. Get a bit, make a bit of him. <laughs> All right. All right. Enough of this. I guess guys, guys and, and girls listening to this or pe- people, gang, whatever. I, I can't keep all my pronoun shape. Uh, straight now any longer um it's a lengthy list i will tell you that um you know this whole episode obviously is about where news can come in the most ex- unexpected places you know i mean we've we've been anticipating some stuff fizzle and then all of a sudden a couple of slips of the lip and next thing you know everyone uh, hundreds of billions of dollars are lost and that's just the way it is in the investment markets it's always kind of been that way but it's it's uh it's ridiculous it's also kind of fun it's kind of what makes um this industry a little bit interesting in my estimation well guys thank you all so much for listening we always love to hear from you all so if you have any questions or comments please by all means drop us a line at trading perspectives at oakworth.com where you can leave us a review on the podcast outlet of your choice as always if you're interested in reading more and hearing more of what we got to say Please go to oakworth.com, take a look underneath the Thought Leadership tab for all kinds of interesting articles and whatnot. All right, Sam, any any unusual news or anything like that? Anything that you want to leave us with here today? No, I just hope I can get a pair of aviators at some point. <laughs> As an aside, I wanted to get some aviator sunglasses at LensCrafters. But now, since I wear progressive lenses, which is just, uh, you know, another way of saying trifocals, it's going to cost me like 400, <laughs> it's going to cost me $453. I will say that is a much better word than using trifocals. <laughs> so, <laughs> so guess what I didn't get? <laughs> all right. That's all I've got today. That's all I've got today, too. Uh, and I don't have any aviators as well. So y'all take care. <laughs>